There was once a Rav sitting in his study three o'clock in the morning. A couple knocks on the door. He opens the door. Emergency. What happened? The wife says a third world war just broke out in our home. Rav says, what happened? We're making a bris tomorrow morning. No, what's the problem? We got into a fight. What name to give the baby? The rabbi asks the lady, the mother, what name do you want? She says, Moshe. My father's name, Moshe. Turns to the husband, what name do you want? He says, Moshe. My father was Moshe. The rabbi says, no. So why can't you both agree on Moshe? She says, no way I'll allow my boy to be named after my father-in-law. He was a manuvel, a mushchis, a lowlife, a fardorben a mensch, an addict, a gambler, a codependent, a narcissist, a self-centered, centered, horrible person. No way my boy is going to be named after him. Rabbi turns to the husband, what do you say? He says, I'm not going to argue with my wife. My father, Taka, wasn't the Tzatzke of Lakewood. But still my father, still my dad, Tata, I want a name. So the rabbi says, this is a serious question. I have to think. Give me 10 minutes. Come back in 10 minutes. They come back in 10 minutes. The rabbi gives a knock on the table. He says, the psak din, the verdict is, tomorrow morning at the bris, you give the baby the name Moshe. Genius. Brilliance. They both scream. After who? After my father, my father. Rabbi says, you give the name Moshe. After whom? For this we wait till the boy grows up. And then we'll see. He will determine for us who he was named after. If he was named after your father, who he was named after your father. There's a contrast I want to make for you tonight. It's a contrast that is heart-wrenching, but also elating. Sad and tragic, and also exhilarating. Two sets of brothers wanted to kill each other. But the expressions are completely different and therefore the results were different. Cain wants to kill his brother and he murders his brother. And when Hashem asks him, where's your brother? He says three words. I'm the guard of my brother. I'm responsible for my brother. And I have to brother, worry for my brother also, especially such a brother. Nobody ever hired me to protect my brother. Years later, there's another set of brothers who don't get along. Yosef and his brothers. They despise him. They loathe him. It also almost ends up tragic. But when Yosef is searching for his brothers and he's lost, and the man finds him and says, what are you looking for? Matavakish. Yosef says four words. Es achai. I'm searching for my brothers. I want to know how my brothers are. I want to see how they're doing. Seventy years ago, historians argue about this nonstop. It's one of the most painful, darkest chapters of Jewish history. A third of the Jewish people were wiped out. America had a powerful Jewish community. It's not 2018, but America had a powerful and large Jewish community. And however you want to spin it, the American Jewish community did not mobilize at least sufficiently to the urgency of six million including one and a half million children being decimated. This is not about judgment. It's not about blame. We can't do anything about it today anyway. It's not about feelings of superiority. It's about a sensitivity to the fact that the six 
darkest years of Jewish history, American Jewry lived, they went to dinners, they went to Schwitzbads, they went to salons. Now you might ask, what should they do? What should they do? They're living in America. What should they do? But the fact is, the alarm, the gishrei, the thunder. How can you eat an ice cream when at some point in 44, 24,000 Jews were being gassed a day? At least scream, holler, stand by the White House, don't stop. Whatever it is. Some people did mobilize. Some Yechidis Gula, some tried. But as a community, collectively, the response was, Hashem Achi Anaychi, let Roosevelt and Churchill win the war, and Hitler and Machshamai will be defeated. Which happened at the end, but not before the greatest price a people has ever paid in human history and in Jewish history. I have a hergish, I have a feeling. I can't prove it logically. But our generation has a mission, as much as we can, to do a little repair. We can't do a big repair. A little repair, a little tikkun, a little, a little repair for that travesty. Our generation was called to change the words, Hashem Ochi Anoichi, to the words, Es Achai Anoichi Mavakish. Yes, I am responsible for my brother. Yes, I have to look out for my brother. Yes, if my brother is bleeding, I can't just retreat to my home and say, there's nothing I can do, it's not my problem. I must search for my brother. Whether the brother is screaming for help, as Yosef did, or sometimes there's the child who is so in pain he can't even scream. She can't even scream for help with the Zoya calls. And I feel that in our generation, the group that personifies most this tikkun is Hatzalah. Why? Why? Any member of Hatzalah, the volunteers and everybody involved, the first thing, the first prerequisite is you have to delete the three words. Hashoimer, Achianoich. You're sitting Friday night at your meal. A whole week you weren't home. You're on the road listening to my WhatsApps. <laughs> I hope that's what you were listening to on the road. I'm being Malamed Schuss. <laughs> Finally, the rabbit said your wife gets to see her husband. You came home three and a half minutes before Shkia. You took a shower, Muat Hamachzik is Samaruba. Suddenly you believe in Shabbat Tamski. Okay, we won't get into it. What happens in Lakewood stays in Lakewood. I mean, what happens in Atzala stays in Atzala. And you sit down with your lichtige kinderlach, shalom aleichem, eishes chayil miyimts, and you actually mean it. He's in the middle of the fish, Yankee just started to say his dvar Torah. You're about to sing kol mekada shabbos, suddenly the speaker goes off the wall, the natural response is, hashoi merachi amoichi. It's 20,000, 25,000 Jews in Lakewood, let somebody else go. But the prerequisite of that solemn member is, es achai, as you jump up, you give your wife the eyes. She gives you her eyes, that code language that's been in your marriage for the last 14 years. Sometimes you think it saves your marriage. Sometimes. <laughs> the more you're away, all's better. Keep it up. Maybe you could also do at Solo of Bora Park as well. For the nights that you have to be home, why not? Somebody asked me, why is it that in ultra-orthodox circles there's much less divorce? I said, it's very simple, there's three months of legal separation. June, July, August, V'yashayim Tuliam Kippur. I'm a who has this in the secular world? 
as I enshrined, entrenched three months. Bye bye. I go to Shurim every night. I go to Shurim every night. And sometimes it's difficult for a marriage. It's always difficult for a marriage. Is that good? <laughs> Some of you remember the story. I don't mean to bring <coughs> back nightmares from your days at Brisk, where you tried being for six months. <laughs> Till you joined that cellar. I'm talking about one guy. Don't worry. Don't take it seriously. So you remember Toysvus and Menach Islam at Zion tells a very strange story. Shloima Amelech has an interesting dintaira. A guy comes, he has two heads. So you would think he has some bigger issues. His big issue is he wants a double portion of the Yerusha. Two heads. Yeah. Today you come to the Rav, you say I have multiple personalities. They say the definition of chutzpah is you come to the therapist because you have a split personality and you want a group discount. But the guy comes to Shleiman Malach and he says, my father was rich. He left over four and a half million bucks plus some real estate on Madison Avenue, like your father. I have two heads. I want double. Peace night. No, I get to Kasha. I get to Taina. Shleiman Malach says, blindfold one head and then pour hot water on the other one. If the second one screams, then you know it's one guy. He gets one portion. If the second head doesn't scream, then it's two people, he gets a double portion. That's the end of the story. I asked you, what's the point of the story? Shlomo Melech's brilliance. Friend, it's the story of Hatzola. We, the Jewish people, let's face it, we don't have one head. We got many, many heads. Three Jews, 19 heads. 19 Jews, 365 heads. Every Jew has a different opinion, and within the Jew himself, he changes his mind, usually from minute to minute. As one Jewish comedian said, I am a man of principles. And if you don't like them, I have other principles. Bring in any community of Jews. Who has one hand? Who thinks the same? Ain't they saying Shabbos? Every Jew argues with himself, certainly with other people. Once it's for my Rebbe, he said, you meet a Jew, you say, Shalom Aleichem. What's the response? Aleichem Shalom. Why don't you say, Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. Imagine in English, good evening, evening good. How are you? You are how? What's up? Up what? Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. The answer is when two Jews meet, even before they get into a conversation, they just say hello to each other, they already have to get into an argument. That's the Yisoy, that's the beginning. Shalom Aleichem, nah, that's Kfira, Pikursus. It's Aleichem Shalom. Once we establish that we're in a fight now, we can begin talking. Jackie Mason, he's the guy who repeats a lot of my jokes, he once told me that when two Jews meet, if within three minutes, they don't establish a family connection. One of them is not Jewish. It could be the Shviger, Shviger, Bezivuk, Chamishi. But there's a family relationship. You know that. I tell you, if two Jews meet, if within three minutes they don't argue about something, one of them is not Jewish. We don't have one head. We have many heads. But you know what? That is not the problem. The problem is not that we have many heads. You know what the problem is? When you pour hot water on one head, how does the other head respond? If one head gets hates zudikivasa, and the other head remains cold, blutic, apathetic, that means it's two people. If one head gets hot water and the other head screams, I don't care that you have a different head, a different opinion, a different perspective, a different mindset. We're supposed to have different mindsets. But that means we're still one person. Es achai anoichi mevakish. I have to tell you two scenes that were so fascinating. Four weeks ago, three weeks ago, Wednesday, Zois Hanukkah, three o'clock in the afternoon, a holy African-American brother was released from prison after 30 years. 
His name, Mark Denny. He was put into prison at the age of 17, being accused of a robbery in Burger King. Not the one you go to, the other one. It's fine. Okay, we won't get into that. He was accused of violating an 18-year-old girl in Burger King in 1987. Falsely accused. Mark Denny, you're Googling it, you can Google it. I know my facts. Mark Denny was put behind bars for 30 years. Zeus Hanukkah, the Brooklyn Supreme Court Justice said, there's no evidence. A 17-year-old boy lost 30 years at the age of 47. He walks out 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I have to say, I felt good for the man. They asked him, what are you going to do? He says, rent a movie, go to a restaurant. Who was waiting for him outside? Four people. His mother, one cousin, another cousin, and a lawyer. Four people. 30 years in prison for no reason. Two hours later, two hours later, another man left prison. You may have heard his name. Sholomar de Khairabashka. Who came to welcome him? First of all, a group of Satmach Siddim nearby came to welcome him at the gas station. And then, within an hour or two, thousands and thousands of people from Monroe to Crown Heights, from Lakewood to Britain, from Chicago to Toronto. The next day I was speaking in the yeshiva of Skokie. You know the yeshiva of Skokie? It's a more, it's an open yeshiva and I, they asked me to give a speech about dealing with your teenage years and discovering your mission in life. So I did my thing. I finished my drasha. The Bach in my head, 150 boys looking at me, Jacob sing, we're not going to dance? I say, let's dance. They start singing, di don, no tzach, di don. Rosh Hashivas were looking as though they never saw their teenage boys like this. They wanted to know, you know, what they were fed for lunch. And it reminded me of what a Jew once told me. His name is Yosef Chess. He's a Jew from Montreal. He told me that the Rosh Hashiva of Lakewood, Reb Shneir Kotler Zechet Tzadik Levrocha, once visited Montreal a summer Shabbos. And he had an Oynik Shabbos after the meal in the house of a Balabas. And Rabbi Yosef told me he was there. The Svardim in Montreal wanted to open a school. At that time, they didn't have money. Since then, the Svardim learned not to rely on the Ashkenazim. But they didn't have money. They came to the Ashkenazim and they said, we need money for a school. So by the Oynik Shabbos, there were a few Ashkenazim Hevra. And they told the you know, we barely could cover our own budget. So now we're going to help them support a school. We can't. So Reb Shnei Kotler Zatzal told him this. There's a Pasuk in Parshas Re'eh, Loises Goydedu. What does Loises Goydedu mean? Chas V'Shalom, when somebody passes away, the pagan practice was to scrape off skin of the body as a sign of grieving. Loises Goydedu, a Jew is not allowed to tear off, scrape off the skin of his or her body. The Gemara in Yevamas Yud Gimel says, Loises Goydedu, Loitasu, Agudas Agudas. Don't splinter the Klal Yisrael into separate groups. Asks the Maharal in Gurari, Givaldik a question. Usually when there's different interpretations on a Posik, they're connected somehow. They have a similarity, a common denominator at Sadashava. Here, the two interpretations, they're so far-fetched. means don't scrape off your skin. And the Gemara says, don't splinter into groups. Maral's question. So Reb Shnei Kotla answered, and this is what he said. It's not two separate interpretations. It's the same exact interpretation. You know why? When you splinter the Jewish people into different groups, you know what it's like? It's like you're mutilating a part of your body. It's like amputating some of your limbs. It's like scraping off the skin of your body because you're dealing with one cohesive organism. The Yerushalmi and the Dorim, it's one goof. 
Lois is going to do. Literally, is Lois Sasso Agudis Agudis. But not, but we don't always live up to that. And I don't know, honestly. I have this chus and the privilege to visit diverse communities from one extreme to another extreme. Jews and Lahavdal non Jews. Today in the Jewish world, a cohesive group that day in, day out, night in, night out, week in, week out, 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours, 25 hours, embodies in every fiber of its being this collective oneness, unity, achrayas, love, passion, as achai, anoichim evakesh. This is Hatzola. This is the story of Hatzola. I'm not part of Hatzola. But I want to tell you what you do for a person like me and hundreds of thousands of others. I'm not talking all the people who benefit from the call. That's an obvious. You save lives. But I'm talking even those who Baruch Hashem don't have to call Hatzola. There was a Jew, listen to this, a young man, a middle-aged guy and his father. His father was 98, he was 48. They lived on a farm and they were very poor. It comes winter, you know winter? It can get very, very cold. Somehow global warming doesn't always work here. Not sure why, it only works in Miami, Los Angeles. We're not part of the globe exactly. It's very cold. They had, the Wi-Fi code is a little respect for the dead, uppercase. They had one coat. They got into a fight, who gets the coat? The father said, I'm 98. If I'm cold, I die. You're a young fellow, you don't need the coat. The son said, I'm out in the farm all day supporting the family. You're inside. I need the coat. So they went to the row for a dintair. Who's right? Who would you give the coat to? The father or the son? The Rav thinks and he said the son is right. The father is in the house. Let him find wood, light a fire. The boy is outside. The son is outside on the farm. He's subjected to the elements. He gets the coat. The son puts on the coat. He won the Donatzach. He's happy. They leave the Rav's office and he's walking back with his father to their house on the barn. And he sees his 98-year-old father is trembling from cold. And he thinks to himself, how despicable can a child be? I won the Dintaira, but I lost the battle for truth, for conscience, for decent human respect. How can I leave my father like this? And he takes off his coat and he says, Tata, you need the coat. And the father is happy. He got the coat. And the next morning he looks at his son going out to the farm trembling from cold and he goes out and he says son mein zun du kriegst the mantle you get the coat name tate you get the coat and now they get into a new fight the father wants the son to have it the son wants the son to have it they go back to the rav the second entire the rav is sitting and the rav thinks and he says wait a minute wait 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 he goes into his bedroom he comes out with a big coat and he says, you know, I have an old extra coat here in the closet. Here's a second coat. You'll both have coats. Beautiful psak. The old man looks at the Rav. He says, Rebbe, I have one question. This you could have done the first time around. You could have taken out the coat the first time around. What do we have to wait? So the Rav told him something very, very insightful psychologically. He says, the first time around, you both came. Each one was screaming, it's my coat. The son was screaming, it's my coat. Father was screaming, it's my coat. So psychologically, subconsciously, I was also screaming, it's my coat, it's my coat. It didn't even dawn on me to share my coat with two people fighting over a coat. The second time around, the son is screaming, it's your coat. The father is screaming, it's your coat. My soul also began screaming. Let me share my coat with you. It's your coat. 
This very few people understand the osmosis, the impact that Hatsala has not only on Hatsala, not only on the people that benefit from Hatsala, but on the consciousness of the Jewish people. When you're around people, when you see people who always say, it's your coat. What can I do for you? It changes everybody consciously and subconsciously in ways that they can't even imagine. However, however, and I don't mean to get in trouble, but let's face it, there's also some benefits of being in Atzala. You know, you're sitting Shabbos by the rough sermon. You don't like him, you don't like his sermons. The Kiddush Club was closed down last month because of the Kindalach. So what are you supposed to do? You were diagnosed as ADD, ADHD, PDD with all the good diagnosis. In the olden days, there was one cure for all of this. It was a frask this side and a frask this side. And everybody was cured or not cured, repressed. Today, it's much more specific. And Nebuch, you ended up in the front row by the Rav's Drosha. And this guy goes for 35 minutes. And he, just the way he starts off, you know it's a killer. There's a Pasuk in this week's parsha. There's a Chsam Seifer. Chsam Seifer says an intro, and you're like, oh my God. And then, Nesmin HaShemayim. Amechaye. The call comes in. And you look at your Chavedim. And you say, Baruch Shepatrani me oyner shalaza hoidula shem ki toiv kiliolam chazadoy. And you put on a very serious face. And you get up. And you give that uh, well known eye blink that commits us ayin to your six chaveidim over there. And it's mummers like a runaway in camp or a runaway in yeshiva. And you're out the door. And it's gewaldic. Let's face it. Yeah, in the middle of Shachis, in the middle of Musaf. It's a Mechaya. Whenever you need a little fresh air, a cigarette. I once asked the coordinator of Hatzal in a particular neighborhood, without name. I once told the stories that somebody said, without names, who was it? Well, without names. I said, you know, I know all the Chavre here. Why did that guy join Hatzal? Without bleeding, he says he was looking for a hetter to smoke on Shabbos. Shine! Bad humor. But he was trying to give his stech to the air. There's a certain, there's a certain, let's call it social benefit. And it's geschmack when you come to a dinner and you block 200 cars. And you don't have to worry about anything. And nobody could say boo to you because you're the guardian angel of Lakewood. Mi you're the manigador, let's face it. Everybody needs you. It's a geschmack. And there's a certain social camaraderie that you have with each other. It's Baruch Hashem, social, psychological, emotional benefits of being in Hatzola. But then there are those in Hatzola who nobody notices. The call doesn't come in. Nobody hears the walkie-talkie, nothing is ringing, they're not running. Nobody looks at them and says, psss, psss. No validation, very little feedback. No one even notices that they're part of Atzala. And these are the individuals who carry the burden, the love, the mysterious nefesh of Atzala. 24 hours a day, far more than the people who go on the calls. And I'm talking about the wives of the Hatzala members. Who? I go back to the Friday night. And she wait, you waited for your husband all week in the middle of the fish. He gets a call. Finally, you thought one night he's going to be with the children. One night. And you're out. 
You think Monday morning, somebody gives your wife a call from that family and says, I want to thank you for letting your husband go Friday night. He saved my child's life. Maybe there are a few individuals who do it. Ashri Chelka. But most don't. They don't even know. They have their own worries. They're chaotic. They're in disarray. They had their issues. Can't blame them. And they in and they out weeks and months and years. Mothers who in a good day carry the full empathy and burden of raising a beautiful family of Jewish children who can sometimes get on their nerves too. And they can't 10 o'clock say, My Riv, Dafyoimi, Mishnebrura, or better, Atzalakol. Rather, in the depth of their heart, you commit yourselves with your heart and soul because you say, I'm proud of my husband who, when he sits down to eat a bistle chicken soup, when the call comes in, he runs. Suffolk to save a Jewish life because he is the guardian and you are the guardian of brothers. And there comes a point in life, I'm not an Atzala, but I, I, on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of Jews in Lakewood and all Jewish communities where Atzala is active every day, every night, I, as the outsider, as the observer, as the spectator, I represent that silent Klal Yisrael and say tonight to all of the women, all of the Nashim Tzitkani as the wives of the Atzala members, B'Shem Klal Yisrael, two words, thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Friends, I want to conclude. with this little story that for me captures so much of what you do what you do in your sacrifice and silence and what you do in your pursuing and your running I heard this from a Rosh Hashiva in Eitz Yisrael and he shared with me that in the early 1970s he went to visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe and the Rebbe asked him why he doesn't get more involved in teaching and guiding and mentoring because he was a very talented person and he said it's not my interest I like more to sit with myself my few Talmidim and learn the Rebbe said but there's so many people who are looking for guidance and looking for inspiration and looking for Adrocha get more involved so he was hesitant so he said, the Rebbe asked him, in Yiddishkeit, which side is more important, the right or the left? Yemin or smile? He said, of course, the right. The right, Kolpinus Shatapoyne. The left is Yat Keha, Yemin Mekareves. The right is always more prominent, Chesed versus Gvur. So he said, so why is it that the Rebbeinu Shalolam created at the heart, Hadam Hu Anefesh, the source of all the blood that gets pumped and gives vitality and life to the whole body is on the left side. The left ventricle of the heart is responsible for the pumping and giving of vitality and life to the whole body. The left, not the right. So he said he was wise enough to be quiet. The Lubavitcher Rebbe told him, I'll tell you why. The heart is not on the left side. The heart is on the right side. Because the function of a heart, the function of a Yiddish heart is to feel somebody else's pain. So when I'm standing in front of you and the function of my heart is to feel you, my heart is on the right because my heart is here for you. And for you, the heart is on the right. I'm standing for you. The heart is on the right when you understand what a heart is. And I heard from him this transformed his entire Hashkafas Oilam. Today in Eretz Yisrael, he built yeshivas, and mentors, people, 
transformed his perspective. I am privileged to be here tonight in the presence of people, women and men. And I say women first, like Hashem, the Sagid Levne Yisrael. I am privileged beyond privilege to be in the presence of women and men, the unsung heroes of Klal Yisrael today, who have real Jewish hearts. What's shot real Jewish hearts? Hearts that are on the right. Because you are the hearts that feel the pulsation of another heart. You have your fingers, your souls on the pulse of other Jewish hearts. You feel it. You breathe it. And in that sense, you are the great Mesachnim of the travesty of Ashoi Merachi Anaychi to a generation that declares as Achai Anaychi Mevakesh. And that's why when Bimhei Rabbi Amenu call Godel Yeshuvu Eina Klau Yisro will be liberated from our door, long, dark, and bitter exile. It's the Hatzola members and their families that will march for it first as the ones who embody the great vision of Sheves Achim Gam Yochat of a united Jewish people. Bimhei Rabbi Amenu Amen. Thank you very much.